All right, everyone. Welcome to the second part of our spring 2018 um, practice exam. Uh, this is for Calculus 3. So embarrassingly, I just recorded, or I thought I recorded this video, I just went over the entire thing, which took like at least 20 minutes, but then I found that I wasn't recording at all. So that's why the, the work is already written out here. So I'm just going to kind of go over uh, my work for these problems. All right, so for the, we left off at number 12, this multiple choice question. Here we were given a position function, r of t, which is cosine, sine, and cosine. And our goal for this problem is to find the sum of the tangential acceleration with the normal or centripetal acceleration. And we want to do so at t equals pi over 2. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to find each of these separately, and then we're going to add them together. All right, so the formula for the tangential acceleration is v dot a over v, which is also the scalar projection of a onto v here. And in order to do this, of course, we need to know what the velocity and acceleration are. So this is when we did some derivatives. So I had the derivative of cosine, sine, and cosine, and I got negative sine, cosine, and negative sine. Then I did the derivative of this, and I got negative cosine, negative sine, and negative cosine. Now, since we're doing this at a particular t value, I just went ahead and plugged in pi over 2, meaning I'm going to use negative 1, 0, negative 1 as my velocity vector, and I'm going to use 0, negative 1, 0 as my acceleration vector, since we're doing it specifically at pi over 2. All right, with all this information in tow, we're now able to figure out what our at is. So I do v dot a, negative 1 times 0 is 0, 0 times negative 1 is 0, and then negative 1 times 0 is also 0. Okay, so we get a dot product with 0, meaning that we have no tangential acceleration. And if you look at the type of function we're looking at here, this sort of makes sense. These are all um, sines and cosines, or circle components, as I like to think of them. Meaning that this particle is likely spinning around in some circular manner, meaning we're not going to be shifting uh, to the left, right, up, and down at all. Um, so we're not going to have any tangential acceleration, but we almost certainly will have some normal or centripetal acceleration. All right, now the formula for that is the magnitude of the cross product of the two divided by the magnitude of v. Um, for this one, we will need to know the magnitude of v since it won't just be a zero in the numerator. Um, so I just took the magnitude of this vector and I ended up getting root two. All right, now I put the root two down there and then I just need to know what the cross product is. So I did the cross product, uh, 0 times 0 is 0, and then we do minus negative 1 squared to give us negative 1. With j, we do negative 1 times 0, negative 1 times 0, giving us 0. And then with k, we do this square right here. So I do negative 1 times negative 1 is 1, and then we have minus 0. And the magnitude of this vector ends up being root 2. So I put root 2 in up there, and I also have a root 2 in the denominator, meaning that we get 1 for our normal component. So that means that at plus an is 0 plus 1, which is equal to 1. And thankfully, that is one of the answer choices. All right, that was the last uh, normal multiple choice question we had on here. Um, the remaining multiple choice questions uh, were bonus, meaning the points that they contributed were above and beyond the total score of the exam. All right, and these are more kind of, they're less computational, a bit more kind of conceptual questions here. So if u of t is a unit vector, then uh, u dot u prime is equal to, and that's where the question stops, but we ended up figuring out the answer was zero, or I figured out by myself off camera. <laughs> um, so u is a unit vector, right? So its magnitude will be one. So if I square both sides of that, that will still be one. Now, whenever we have the magnitude of a vector squared, um, that's going to be equal to u dot u. All right, now we know if u dot u is one, and we do the derivative of everything, then what do we get? Well, the derivative of a constant is zero. And then for the derivative of these, since these are functions of t, we need to do the product rule. So I do the derivative of this u first and leave the other one alone. And then I do the reverse here. And we end up getting the same thing since it doesn't matter which order you do the dot product in, it's going to be the same either way. So we really just have two of the same thing. But if we divide both sides of the equation by the scalar 2, we have u prime dot u is 0, which is what we were trying to compute to begin with. All right, our next problem here 
um, was asking us which one of the statements was true for these vectors u and v, which are plane vectors, like flat in the paper here. Um, and the first statement that they gave actually ended up being the correct one, which was that u dot v is less than zero. So dot products of magnitude tends to be larger the more parallel vectors are to one another, but it tends to be more negative if they're pointing in opposite directions. And if we put these vectors uh, back to back here, we see that they're pointing in opposite directions, meaning that their um, u dot v is going to be negative. And then uh, the other statements, we can kind of go through those, see why they're false. This is simply saying the opposite of what we know is true. Um, so yeah, that's definitely gonna be false. Uh, the remaining statements claimed that u dot u cross v is either less than zero or greater than zero. But both of these are false because u dot u cross v is actually exactly equal to zero. Reason being is that u will be parallel to a cross product that it's involved in. That's one of the main uses of a cross product is get something that's perpendicular to the given vectors. So if we dot u with something that's perpendicular to itself, it will be zero. So it can't be greater than or less than zero. All right, then finally we come to this one here. Um, they said that R was some vector value function and it had well-defined unit tangent, unit normal, and unit binormal vectors, meaning that we can take all the necessary derivatives and plug in any T value we want to with no problems. All right, and then this one also gave us a list of statements and we had to see which one was uh, true here. So the first statement was saying that the magnitude of T cross N is zero. Now t cross n is defined to be b hat, that's how b hat is defined as this cross product, but then the magnitude of b hat will have to be 1 because it's a unit vector, so this magnitude cannot be 0, so that's clearly false. The next one is saying that b hat cross b hat is 1, and this one's true for the same reason that we had up here. Any unit vector dotted with itself will give a dot product of 1. So that means that this is going to be true. The next problem is essentially saying the negation of what we're saying here. This is saying that the dot product of a unit vector with itself will be zero, which we know that's not true, it's going to be one. And then finally, this is saying that b hat is n hat cross t hat, but this one is false because they have this in the wrong order. b hat is really t hat cross n hat. And remember, unlike dot products, Cross products are not commutative. You can't just flip the order of them and it'll be the same. However, if they wrote the question like this, where they put a negative in front of all that, that would be true, because if you flip the order of a cross product, you will get the negative of what you got before. All right, so those are all the multiple choice questions. And then here are the two free response questions. So the first one, let P be a plane containing these two lines given by symmetric equations. So here are the symmetric equations for these two lines, and we know that these planes are lying, or these lines are lying inside the plane. So the first part of the problem is we need to find an equation for the plane. All right, so what I'm going to do with these lines is says since they're in the plane, I can use them to generate points that are in the plane. So I'm going to get two points from this line here and one point from this one. You could do it the other way around too. You can get maybe one point from this and two points from here, but you can't get all of your points from the same line. If you do that, then your cross product will be zero and that won't help you. So we need at least one representative from each. And I, ch I chose to pick two from here because I immediately know what the y value is, so it makes it easy. So from L2, um, let's see. So for here I plugged in x is negative one and um, that ended up giving me um, zero for, wait a minute, no, I didn't do that, sorry. Um, for this one, what I did was I plugged in x is zero, and then that forced this to be negative one, meaning that z has to be negative two for this equation to also be equal to negative one. All right, then I plugged in x is negative two into here, which will make this be one. That's gonna make z be zero here for that to match, and y is negative one for both. And then finally, I just plugged in x is 1 up here to make this 0, and the things that would make these be 0 as well would be y is 0, and z is negative 2. So I have my three points here, and then from these three points, we can generate two different vectors here. So I generated vector 1 by doing this minus this, giving me this vector, and then I did vector 2 by doing this point minus this point. 
And remember, it doesn't matter which order you do it in or how you combine these together, but you do need to have um, each one, each point represented at least once in one of your two vectors. All right, then I did the cross product of these to get something that is normal to the plane. Because these vectors both lie in the plane since they're pointing between points that are also in the plane. But if we do the cross product, we're going to get something perpendicular to these. So we do our cross product here, just like normal. And we end up getting negative 2, 2, negative 2 for this, which is our, our normal vector. And then finally, when we have a normal vector, we can get a plane equation by doing the normal vector as the, the coefficients for x, y, and z. And then I do x, y, and z minus a point in the plane. And I just chose this one. But you could have also chosen these, and that would have been fine too, or any point in the plane. So I put x minus 0 here, y minus negative 1 there, and z minus negative 2 here. And then I did these as coefficients. And there is my plane equation. And the problem didn't say, oh, provide a vector equation for the plane, provide a, um, um, a scalar equation or anything like that. So I just, I just wrote it like this. So that's totally fine. All right, next, we need to find the distance from the point 3, 2, 1 to the plane that we just found. All right, so the formula for the distance between a point and a plane is right here, where a, b, and c are the coefficients for your normal vector. Now, what I did here was I divided um, everything by 2, because 2 went into everything, and then I distributed. So I end up getting that my plane is also going to be negative x plus y minus z minus 1 is 0. So this is my a, b, c, and then this is d right there. And then my x, y, and z are the x, y, and z coordinates for my point. So I do this right here. I put 3, 2, 1 um, multiplied by each of these. So that gave me this up here. And then I have the square root of each of the normal vector components squared. So this is effectively giving me the size of my normal vector. All right, so then when I do this computation, I end up with 3 up here and root 3 down there, giving me a grand total of root 3 when we're finished. All right, and then our final free response problem, number 2, it gave us this position function, cosine of t squared, negative sine of t squared, and t squared, and this is for t being between 0 and root pi. And they wanted us to compute a bunch of different things with this. So the first thing was to compute the velocity, and that is just doing the derivative of each component here. So we do a chain rule for this, and we get that. We do another chain rule here, and we get this. And then finally, we do a derivative, a power rule here, and we get that. The next thing they ask for is the speed, which is the magnitude of the velocity. So I square all of the components, add them together, and put a square root over it. Now this looks really hideous, but what we could do is we can notice that we have a Pythagorean pair mixed in with this. So that's going to give us the coefficient of it when we add them together. So we have that. And then we already had a 4t squared, so this becomes 8t squared. And since our t is positive, we don't need to worry about an absolute value, so I did the square root of this, and I got 2 root 2t. Two All right, the next part of the problem asked us for the unit tangent vector, which is defined to be the derivative of our position divided by the speed. All right, now they wanted this specifically at t equals root pi. So what I did was I plugged in root pi in for my v right here, giving me all of this. And I plugged in root pi in for my speed, giving me this bottom. And then we saw some cancellation happen here. So the twos can all cancel out, and then every term has a root pi as well, so those can all cancel out. All that's left in the denominator is a root 2, and then up here we have sine of pi, which gives us 0. We have cosine of pi, which is negative 1, but then we have another negative, and then we divide by root 2. And then finally, this is simplifies to 1, but then we have a root 2. So this ends up being our unit tangent vector. And one way you can kind of check your work here is just make sure the magnitude of this is going to be 1, but it does end up being that way. And then our final task is to figure out the arc length of this curve from 0 to root pi. So remember, the, integral, the arc length integral is the same thing as integrating the speed over your range here. Because remember, the speed is the square root of x prime squared plus y prime squared plus z prime squared. Now, we already have a nice formula for the speed. The speed is 2 root 2t. So I'm just going to integrate that. I do a power rule. 
raise this to be a square and then divide by 2, cancel that out, and then I plug in root pi. And root pi squared is pi, and then we just have this coefficient of root 2. So this ends up being root 2 pi in length here. All right, that takes care of everything remaining on this exam. So I'm going to post this video combined um, with the one we did in class shortly. All right, so um, yeah, best of luck studying, and I hope you all do well on the exam.